This is Mike Leggett. My partner is Dan Zungari. It is December 3rd. We are interviewing Rear Admiral Dunn, Robert Dunn. Go ahead. Okay, um, we're just going to start out with your, your name. So, uh, please say your full name. Robert Howard Dunn. Okay. <clears throat> when and where were you born? I was born in Rome, New York on December 13th. 1938. Okay, um, prior to your service in the U.S. Navy, uh, what education did you receive? Eighth grade. Eighth grade. Um, what kind of jobs did you work if you worked? Farmer. Farmer? Okay, um, so what was your motivation to join the Navy and when did you do it, decide to do it? Well, I got tired of children shit and hauling and woe, uh, and uh, back then you were expected to carry on the family heritage. My family's been in New York State since 1743, and we've been farmers all that time, up until the 50s. Uh, I learned about the Navy from a school teacher. And uh, one day I went to my father and I said, Dad, I'm just tired of the farm life. I don't like it. I want to get out of it. He says, well, that's your choice. You're a man now. And I was 16. So uh, they took me into Syracuse. And we talked to, I talked to the Navy uh, recruiter. And we set an induction date. Uh, I turned 17 on the 13th day of December of 1955. I was on my way to boot camp on the 29th day of December 1955. <clears throat> so I wanted to get off the farm. Uh, it's a typical farm, farm boys. Uh, the Navy introduced me to things called underwear, toothbrush, toothpaste. <laughs> Uh, they gave me three pair of shoes I, could, I had to wear uh, all year long. Where on the farm, uh, you wore shoes in wintertime. All right. Um, did you look at any other branches of the military, or did no. you just primarily look at the Navy? I went to the Navy. My family's been Navy for. Well, I've got a, a great, 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 great uncle. <laughs> that was on the USS Constitution. All right. So, um, your, your family just thought it was your choice, or did they have any... My father allowed us boys and the girls to, when they were 16, uh, we had quite a family chat. He'd sit down, my mother and him and, and I, we sat down uh, after I told him that I didn't want to be a farmer. Uh, I don't know, two or three weeks or so, uh, we sat down and I told him, I says, you know, it just, just say that. Uh, I'm happy to be home, I'm, you know, it, my, my home life was like anybody else's that was raised on a farm in that period. It was a hard life. I never got paid a dime by my father or anybody else for the work that I did. I started working as a farmhand when I was eight years old, feeding chickens. Uh, your your feed, but what what your pay was the food that you ate, the house that you lived in, the clothes that you had. Okay, that's what it was. Uh, now is different. Do I agree with it? No, but that's the society that we've built. Do I support it? No, but I accept it. Learn to accept the things that I can't change. So, um, you joined the Navy, get out of there. Uh, where did you go for basic training? Bainbridge, Maryland. Mm -hmm. and what, was the, what was the weather like there? Was it Cold. Different, a lot different from where you were from? No, not too much. Okay. Not too much. Did you find uh, basic training to be hard or very difficult compared to what you thought it would be like? Or? At first it was very difficult. It was uh, 13 weeks long. 
Uh, but within the first four or five weeks, uh, you begin to learn that if you wanted to be a success and get and graduate from boot camp, you had to learn to be part of a team. In other words, you didn't do anything. I was in there uh, boot camp with 105 other guys, all from New York State. We were called the Empire Company. Okay. Um, you learned that you didn't do anything to disgrace the company. Uh, the Marines call it uh, Semper Fi. The Navy calls it 4.0. 4.0, that's the best you can get. So you were always working towards that 4.0. Um, you learned uh, what you do affects what everybody else gets. In other words, if you screw up, the whole company gets punished. So you got 105 guys on your neck. Why the hell did you do that? <laughs> so uh, there was instructors there. What did you call the instructors? Sir. Sir. What was their rank? Were they uh, sergeants like? Mine was a first class petty officer in the Navy. That's an E6. I don't know what it relates to as far as the other services, but it's an E6. E6. Did you um, form any very tight friendships during boot camp? Yeah. All right. So let me put this here. All right. So 13 weeks later, you graduate from boot camp. Uh, how were, how did you feel about that? Successful. Uh, during that 13 weeks, not only did I complete. Uh, the boot camp training, but I also completed my high school. Mm. That was extra work. You, 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 you learned your Navy trade during the day, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, at night, you had to go to classes. It was mandatory. It was not something that was uh, uh, voluntary. The Navy would induct you without a high school education, but it was part of the curriculum that you complete high school to graduate from boot camp. So they made one just as important as the other. Mm. Alright. Um, were you assigned, or, yeah, of course you were, but uh, what was your rank after boot camp? Seaman apprentice. And uh, were you uh, stationed somewhere with a specific job, or did you request? Well, uh, when I come out, when you come out of boot camp, you go home for uh, two weeks leave. Mm -hmm. Okay, to uh, reunite with the family and, and this and that and next thing. In my case, uh, I come home for two weeks leave, and uh, everything was wonderful when I got home. That day I got home, uh, I'm sleeping the next morning, five o'clock. My father's up there in, the, in the, my bedroom, waking me up with his damn shovel in his hand. It snowed the night before, and he says, "Hey, you got to go to work, boy." I said, "But Dad, I'm in the Navy." He says, "You're under my roof." <laughs> so the next the next afternoon after I got two shoveling out the driveway, the next afternoon I reported to my next command down in <laughs> Norfolk, Virginia. And uh, so what was your what was the uh, task out in Albany? Pardon me. What was your task out in Albany? Like what was your command? What was your job? Oh, I was a gunner's mate. Okay. And uh, what did a uh, gunner's mate do? Repaired, fired, uh, manned. Uh, Guns that were on a ship that he was assigned to. Uh, what ship was that? At first, I was assigned to the USS Wisconsin, the battleship of the Iowa class, uh, number sixty-four. Okay, um, you first served in the underwater demolitions team before you became a, a Navy Sealer, correct? Yeah, but you're getting ahead of yourself. Okay. Uh, I had to become a success as a gunner's man. Okay. See, in the Navy, uh, it's not only what you got in your head, it's what you can do with these. Mm -hmm. Okay. The two work hand in hand. I had to become a success as a gunner's man before underwater demolition school was even an option. All right. So I was in about two years. Uh, and I had what they call quarterly marks. I had above average quarterly marks. 
which is uh, part of that 4.0 scale. 4.0 is the best that you can get. 3.0 is failing. All right, if you're anywhere from 3.5 and up, then you get recommended for these specialty schools, special trainings. So I was asked if I'd like to go into underwater demolition. I'd still be assigned to the ship. Uh, heck yeah, you know, farm boy, hey, show me something, you know, I'm scared. Uh, so uh, six weeks down in Miami, I learned uh, how to scuba dive with a tank. <coughs> learned about explosives, how to set them, how to time them, where to put them to do whatever job was to be done. And that was six weeks long. After that, I went back to the ship. Like, did your just your basic chores uh, out in Albany and the USS Wisconsin was the same, but you were UD qualified, or did your uh, your job change since you were UD qualified? No, no, uh, my job did not change. I was still a gunner's mate. Mm -hmm. I still had my same general quarter station and all of that. I was still expected to excel or do the best I could. I put it that way. Uh, at being a gunner's mate and keeping up to date on uh, new explosives as they come out and stuff like that. Um, during peacetime, underwater demolition uh, is an exacting science. Uh, we'll say that there's a, a, a natural harbor, okay? But what's blocking deep draft ships, like a battleship or a carrier, or a heavy cruiser, something like that, uh, to be able to get into that port is there's a natural made reef. Okay? Well, underwater demolition is exactly what it says. You map out uh, your target, which is the reef, and you dive down and you set charges. Charges are to be them, uh, uh, set off on certain intervals. Okay, so it disperses that rock, okay, giving it a flat bed with a V-shaped channel for the ship to navigate through. And that's basically what, what we did. We did that in different places, here in the States, overseas. Uh, uh, we did it uh, for commerce. So it was a very physical, demanding job. Oh, yeah. Had to be in good shape. Oh, yeah. Training was hard during those six weeks, or in comparison to like boot camp, was it different? Harder. Harder. More intense. Mm -hmm. uh, in boot camp, there was always room for error. Mm -hmm. uh, error was accepted as part of the learning process. In UDT school, you set a fuse wrong, you're dead. Because. Uh, after about two weeks, you were using live explosives. And, it, you know, you're underwater, you got a, a tank on, you got 50 pounds of, uh, anywhere from 1 to 50 pounds of weight, depending on the depth you had to go to, uh, which added to your difficulty in swimming. Okay, but you had to be able to set the charge, get away. Okay before the charge went off. Okay. Um, I have ear damage today because of being underwater with too many uh, underwater uh, uh, explosions uh, damaged both eardrums. Okay. Um, how long were you attached to a UDT team or how did your like uh transfer from UDTs to uh, whatever you did next? Like, uh, all right. The next thing that I did after UDT is I went to uh, Gunner's Mate School up in Great Lakes. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a 10-week course. It covered every gun that the Navy at that time had. That's everything from a 22 pistol to a 16-inch rifle uh, uh, chipboard uh, gun.
And uh, that was 10 weeks long? Where was that? Was that like training or was that mostly? It was training. It was training. You actually had to learn how to repair, how to troubleshoot, how to fire, how to aim, you know, how to hit your targets. Uh, the 16 inch gun and some of the targets are 20 miles away. Mm -hmm. And you're throwing a projectile that weighs 2,700 pounds um, against a, a, a 22 rifle. You had to be an expert with a 22 rifle. You had to be an expert with a Thompson submachine gun. You had to be an expert with a 30 caliber carbine. You had to be an ex one, an expert with the M1 Garand. You had to be an expert with the uh, Browning automatic rifle. Okay, you had to qualify your team. Okay, uh, whether it was a three-inch gun or a five-inch gun, a six-inch or an eight-inch or a fourteen-inch or a sixteen-inch, uh, that's when you uh, become part of a crew, uh, gun mount crew, uh, turret crew, uh, and you had to qualify for battle efficiency E uh, by hitting the target to graduate. If you didn't graduate. You didn't graduate. You only had 10 weeks. You didn't just stay there until you completed it or you got your battle efficiency E. Uh, you had 10 weeks to do it and you had to qualify in all in classes. Uh, the only good thing about it is the only basic difference is everything got bigger. Basically a 3 inch 70 or 3 inch 50, excuse me, 3 inch 50 gun operates the same way as a 16 inch 45 caliber turret does. A three inch gun is good for about four miles. A 16 inch turret is good for about 20 miles. See? But the what makes it work, the mechanics, it's what they call hydroelectric operated, okay, is the same. It's just bigger. So what you, the only thing you had to do is learn how to communicate with your fire control people, okay. Uh, you had to learn the maintenance, you had to learn how to repair it, okay. Uh, but again, like I say, the only big difference was is that the size. The breech block for a three inch gun you can hold in one hand. The breech block for a 16 inch gun uh, probably weighs four, five hundred pounds. No, well, what exactly is the breech block? For the breech block is what closes the breech after the gun is loaded. Mm -hmm. You close the breech block, and the gun is fired. You never, you cannot fire a shipboard gun with the breech block open. Hmm. It's impossible. The electronics <clears throat> and the percussion uh, por uh, portions of the design of the gun prevents that. Okay. Um, like, what would happen if, say, could it be possible for, like, one man out of your group during that training to fail and, like, the other men pass, or if one man didn't, you know, step up to par, would the... You passed as a crew. As a crew? Mm -hmm. Once you passed the BAR, Browning Automatic Rifle, that was the end of your single opportunities. Mm -hmm. And you had two weeks. All right, I had it made because I was a hunter, I was a farm boy. So I hunted squirrel and, and, and rabbits and stuff like that. So, so firing a 22 rifle was, was just like falling off uh, a log for me. But for guys from the cities, it was more difficult. So as you progressed through class, your, your teammates would change. See, they didn't slow down the training to accommodate people that were not adapting. Okay, uh, as you adapted and as you learned, your team or crew member or turret member or gun mount team member, okay, uh, would change until the last couple of weeks. See, the last couple of weeks is when you had learned all you can learn. You're at the point where you're going to qualify for your battery efficiency E in all those weapons. And if you missed one, you did not graduate. But if you qualified for your battle efficiency E, the Navy, to show their appreciation for your intensity 
of training promoted to two grades. I went into school as a seaman, that's an E3. I qualified coming out of gun school, so I went from E3 to E5, which is the second class petty officer. Now, um, for like the men who would fall back and fail, were they like kicked out of that course, or were they allowed to like go back to the next class? Coming it depended through? upon their command. Their command paid uh, to have people trained. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, if the command decided, yeah, we're going to keep this guy there, he's showing the potential, uh, potential uh, to learn. But he just, you know, you, you you take a guy from New York City back in the fifties, uh, people didn't own guns like they do now. Okay. Uh, and you give him a, a Browning automatic rifle, which is a 30 caliber machine gun that you hold in your arms. Okay. Uh, he's lost. He don't know one end from the other. He's lucky if he can find a trigger. Okay. So, uh, it doesn't mean that the man is stupid. It doesn't mean that the man cannot learn. It means that, that people with the background like I have, with firearms, okay, that's the reason I chose to be a gunner's man. The Navy chose me to be a gunner's man. I chose it also because of my background. So um, after you know you finished this course and mm -hmm. you're qualified, mm -hmm. were you uh, sent back to your old command? Yes. And you're still serving with UDT mm -hmm. teams and you were just back to... Back to the Wisconsin as a gunner's mate, second class. Okay. I left as a seaman. There was a lot of people that uh, didn't appreciate the, uh, <laughs> the automatic promotion. Yeah. Okay. Uh, especially the third class petty officers. Uh, to become rated, what they call rated in the Navy is difficult. When you take a test for a specific rating and rate, you're in competition with everybody in the American fleet taking the same exam. And they only pr promote a percentage of the top. If you pass and don't get promoted, you're what they call quoted. Okay, that automatically qualifies you for the next exam. Okay. So I passed two exams in 13 weeks. 10 weeks, excuse me. Hmm. By Navy standards. And that's what everything is gauged by. What Navy standards are is what it goes by. So basically, you left at a lower rank, you come back and you were higher. Yeah. And then everyone was just like, hey, what happened? That's right. <laughs> and you know, the guys, that, they all wanted to go to school. But <laughs> these were guys that, that, that fell into that 3.0 uh -huh. to 4.9. If you fell into that category, you didn't get the opportunities. Now, I can't speak for any other branch in the military but the Navy. Mm -hmm. All right? The Navy promotes on your knowledge, your working knowledge, your attitude, your conduct. Uh, uh, you get more opportunities. Uh, that's what the Navy, how the Navy handles. <clears throat> okay, um, so when did, like, I don't mean to jump ahead if you want to mm -hmm. fill anything in, but like, uh, so when did you hear about the Navy SEAL program? All right, uh, I had taken the, uh, gone down the, uh, with the Wisconsin on our final cruise mm -hmm. to Buenos Aires, Argentina. Uh, came back uh, to Norfolk, Virginia in 57, uh, put the ship out of commission. Uh, picked up a ship called the USS Canberra. It's an unusual ship. Uh, it was the first guided missile heavy cruiser. All right, it carried hull number two. The Boston was not completed. The Canberra was finished first. So it technically, even though it held hull number two, it was originally the first guided missile heavy cruiser. At Terrier 3, which is the most advanced surface-to-air missile. 
what it was, it was uh, the USS Canberra uh, that served uh, in World War II. And what they did is they took off the after turret, an 8-inch gun, uh, a couple of 3-inch and a 5-inch mount uh, to make room for the missiles. No launching systems and all that. Uh, but its main armament was still the 8-inch guns. Uh, put that in commission, 57, uh, transferred off of it in 60, uh, re-enlisted in 60, uh, once the USS Newport News. Uh, the Newport News was a standard World War II heavy cruiser not converted. Boston and Canberra were experimental ships. So this was the Navy's first attempt to put surface-to-air missiles aboard a ship to see if they would work. All of the test data said, yeah, but we took them into actual combat conditions. Uh, we took them up to the North Pole. We took them into the Mediterranean. We took them into uh, the Antarctic. Took them up to Alaska. These cruises, I'll never forget these cruises. Okay. Uh, they were also showboats. Go to different ports, ports that other ships didn't go, go to. To show the flag, to show, hey, modern ships, you know, the America way is the way to go, da 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 da. <laughs> uh, we were ambassadors, uh, uh, in a way. Uh, to get assigned to a ship like that, you had to be a 3.5 sailor or better. Because the Navy wasn't going to take a chance on sending you into a, a city, into a port in some foreign country, and you mess up. Mm -hmm. Serious. But it's the civilian population. So you had to be squared away. If you weren't, you didn't go. You didn't go on no ships. So only the best one. Because mm -hmm. you're representing the country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, not just to say uh, you're representing the country is, is, is accurate but not complete. You're representing every American anywhere in the world that you go. Well, those stars and stripes are up on the main mast uh, and you're pulling into port. That's what people look at. Okay. I'll give you one example of this. Uh, there is a Navy, a naval tradition, civilian and military, that a merchantman dips its colors to a man of war. And a man of war dips its colors in return. It's like a salute. Okay. 1960, we were in Hong Kong. And Hong Kong, there's ships from all over the world, all over the world. So we went into Hong Kong, we was there two weeks. Okay. On the way out, our colors are flying, our guns are all up at 45 degrees, big, flashy, special paint, you know, mm -hmm. shiny, uh, uh, high gloss paint on the ship and all that. The last ship on the line, merchantman, was from Red China. Now, the rules are, is the merchantman is supposed to dip its colors when you're bowed astern. See, he's tied up. You're moving. But it didn't dip its colors. We got broadside, and somebody in the missile uh, section got the word a little bit early, rotated the, what we call address missiles to draw them down. When those missiles started moving, that flag on the Chinese ship went down to the deck. We tipped our colors and proceeded down the sea. But that's respect. Uh, but they weren't going to do it. It just, it just had happened that way. It wasn't planned. Uh, the orders were that no ship nor missile mount was to move in any way during our stay. Uh, when you go to sea, they set and go to, in the port. They set what they what they call a special sea and anchor detail. Uh, it's uh, specific jobs in case the ship gets in trouble going out or coming in. 
Um, and we put our best face forward, okay? Uh, everybody's in their dress uniforms and all this other kind of thing. Uh, but the orders from the Admiral who was on board, Admiral Taylor, who was on board, uh, uh, was that no ship nor mount was to move until the special sea and anchor detail on leaving port was secured. And that's usually at the three mile limit. But somebody in the missile uh, control room got excited and one of the missiles went up to the, uh, to take a terrier down. All right, it's got to go up 90 degrees, rotate 180 degrees, and then down. Okay, it's a reverse for Logan. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, the American Navy, even today, has a tremendous amount of respect by its equals. So after uh, like this port, like I don't know, uh, what do you say? Like, um, like would you just head back to the states, or how would it work? Like it depends. Back? It depends. Uh, you you would deploy for a certain specific period of time mm -hmm. to do a certain specific thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, most navy ships work between the west coast which is the first fleet, into the seventh fleet, which is on the uh, east coast of uh, what would be the Pacific Ocean, okay? And in that area of the world, from pole to pole. The second fleet, which was, uh, oh, by the way, the first fleet was, was uh, uh, headquarters was in San Diego. Uh, the second fleet, which was its responsibility was to protect the East Coast, okay. Uh, they went to uh, uh, the Med Mediterranean, they went to North Atlantic, they went to South Atlantic, and just did their normal uh, cruises. The purpose for the United States Navy is to allow free commerce in the sea lanes. Nobody is, uh, that's our job during peacetime, is to keep those sea lanes open. Do whatever you got to do, but don't let anybody interfere with commerce. Whether it's our commerce or somebody else's commerce, not the point. The point is, the big bully around the corner, he don't pick on the little guy because the little guy's got a ship out there. Okay, we've done that many times. Uh, got involved in search and rescue missions many times, many times. Uh, ship sink. Uh, picked up survivors many times. Um, and that's pretty much it, unless you're on a special ship. Mm -hmm. uh, a first ship of its kind, okay? Um, I was, I, I went uh, from uh, the Canberra uh, into uh, SEAL training. Uh, successful completion of the SEAL training uh, called for an automatic transfer from the ship. So that's where my career was at that point in time. Mm -hmm. This is uh, 1962. <coughs> well, 62. Uh, I got called into the uh, uh, ship's gunner's office, which is a full commander on cruising. Uh, Gun boss, they call him, mm -hmm. and uh, he said, uh, "Donnie, he says uh, we got a special program we'd like to send you to." And he says, "I'll warn you now." He says, uh, "They're going to test you beyond anything anything has ever tested you before in every conceivable way." Are you interested? I said, "Heck yeah." He said, okay, since you said yes, I will tell you this, you can quit at any time and return to the ship. No disgrace, no nothing. Nobody aboard this ship will know where you're going. The only person aboard this ship will know where you're going is the commanding officer. He says, I won't even know where you go. But if you complete it, you're in for 
the career of your life for as long as you want, for as long as you can handle. Um, and uh, after psychological examinations, physical examinations, uh, I was transferred to uh, Miramar. Uh, California. That's where I started my SEAL training at Miramar. That was uh, early 63. And it was by presidential order, John Kennedy, that the SEALs be started, uh, the program be initiated. They didn't even know if they were going to be successful. And something very few people know uh, that I can share. Our original, I was in class number 12, all right, our original instructors were Marine Recon Sergeants and Sergeants from the 82nd Airborne Green Beret. They were the ones that taught us our uh, training on how to handle ourselves aboard uh, uh, ashore under combat conditions. Uh, Navy UDT instructors taught us how to handle ourselves in the water. Now, uh, the SEALs have been active uh, 40 years. We have, they, they have their own SEAL training uh, instructors. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that's pretty much the way it went. You uh, had 13 weeks of training. Uh, the last week was called Hell Week, even back then. And that's a, you couldn't put it in a better text as, than to call it Hell Week. Uh, um, our class started out with 88 people. Okay, Eight graduated 13 weeks later. Amazing. It's amazing training. Yeah, I've read a little bit about it. Well, I'll, I'll put this in there. I don't know whether the school will appreciate it or not. But I'm a convicted Christian. Okay. And when I started SEAL training, I said a prayer. I prayed that, well, God, you know, uh, this training is offered. Uh, they say they're going to test me beyond all endurance. But I know that if it's what you want me to do, I'll be a success. And all I did was try to do the best I could do. SEAL training is one thing, really. It's teaching you to operate as a complete team. Whether there's two of you in a team or eight. A SEAL team larger than eight people is rare. Uh, usually somewhere around six, seven, eight max. Because mm -hmm. you lose that cohesiveness that makes the SEAL team successful. So, like during uh, SEAL training, like just kind of regular, well, not regular, but a training day, like what would they run you through as far as like physical requirements and PT? Everything was aimed at the team effort, mm -hmm. not at the single effort. Uh, everything was aimed at a combination of physical capabilities matched with mental capabilities. Okay. Yeah, uh, I carried 50 pounds on my back and, and went through a, a rotation. Yeah. Um, but what was my proficiency carrying in that 50 pounds? All right. When I was, in, I was about six foot tall, I weighed 180 pounds. I'm 5'10", I weigh 225. Uh, a lot of belly hair. But anyway, uh, uh, they go for muscle tone rather than they do mass. Um, Navy SEALs, special warfare people from the other branches do tremendous things. Okay. I'm partial because I'm a Navy SEAL. I'll always be a Navy SEAL. My hands are registered weapons in three states. 
because of the training. They know how to put it in, but they don't know how to take it out. That's the problem. And all that is explained to you. You know that before going in. Um, I've been retired since 1985. I'm still this far down the road, 18 years. I'm still adjusting to civilian life. I'm retired E9. That's a master chief. I'm used to speaking and people jumping. Okay. I reported only to the commanding officer, whether he'd be a Navy captain or an admiral. That's the only person I reported to. And it's quite an adjustment. Okay. Uh, Navy SEALs, special warfare people in general, when they first get out, get in trouble with the law. Did I? Yeah. Am I proud of it? No. It's packed. That's one thing about Navy SEAL training is you learn to accept the facts. You learn to accept the things that you cannot change. You learn to work as a group. You learn to work as a success. Because if you're not successful, you're dead. It's that, it's that simple. Um, I, I've read a little bit about SEAL training for this interview and uh, some of the past. Today it's divided into three phases. We had the basic conditioning, the diving, and then like land combat. Was it anything similar to that when you went through it? Yeah. They separated it into phases? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You had to be a success at one before you went to another. Right. In other words, uh, you were uh, Navy uh, or Marine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, today, the Navy SEALs accept members from any branch of the Armed Forces. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the Navy SEALs are the elite of the special warfare people. Now, I know I'm going to get an argument <laughs> out of guys from uh, Marine Recon or Delta Force or Green Beret or whatever. But none of those outfits work on land, on sea, and in the air. SEAL stands for service, water service, E. Earth, land, surface. A, okay, for air. And L is for leadership. It spells SEAL. It's an acronym. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not a, it's a word, yes, but it's also, with the Navy, it's an acronym. It's not a, a true word. There's a period between each one of those letters. And that's something that nobody else knows other than a SEAL. That's, it's an acronym. We weren't given the name SEAL because we work in the water. <laughs> <laughs> because we do a lot of work out of water. Mm -hmm. There's Navy SEALs in Iraq right now. Yeah. Nowhere near the water. Nope. Um, like, for the men in your, in your, uh, your, uh, class, um, like, the men that, like, ended up graduating, like, were you guys, like, shipped together, or was it a, were you, like, dispersed after training into different no, units? No, no, once you became a unit, all right, uh, we graduated as a class. Mm -hmm. We went on to advanced training, uh, survival training, uh, Arctic, mountain, river, uh, jungle, forest, all kinds of training, survival training. Mm -hmm. uh, this was about uh, 13, 14 months. Uh, during this period of time, we were also susceptible to being called on to go out on operations, which we were. All right, if you remember the late 60s, uh, this world was in pretty bad shape all over. Okay. Uh, countries that I've been to, I can't tell you. Uh, things that I did, I can't tell you. Uh, they're still restricted. My military uh, uh, record that is available to uh, anyone who wants to go down to Washington to look at it ends on October 26, 1962. 
nothing of my SEAL training from the day I left the ship to the day I retired is available without a majority vote of the Congress, both houses of Congress, and a unanimous vote of the United States Supreme Court. Okay, so uh, you finished your post buds, or is that what they called it back then, buds, for basic underwater demolition seal? Whatever. That's what they call it now. Yeah. So, after you finished your training, post schools and everything, uh, you were assigned to a seal team, or no? You were selected to do certain things. D d members of the team uh, excelled mm -hmm. at different things. Uh, there were guys that were stronger. There was guys that uh, understood technical data a little more. There was guys that uh, had the ability to get in and out of tight places better than any other guy. Not that he was better. He was more adapt to it. He was more adapt to thinking under fire like this and making the right decision. I was selected to go into intelligence gathering and uh, uh, counterinsurgency. Basically, without violating any laws or any oath, um, intelligence gathering is working in a, under a, a covert uh, situation. A team of two, uh, and you went to wherever you were told, and you tried to find whatever it is that you were told to find, whether it be a person, place, or thing. You did whatever you had to do. The only orders you were given were no civilian casualties. Uh, how many of these type of operations were I involved in? You'll never learn it from me, because I took an oath that I would never divulge anything about it. That they existed? Did we get involved? Yeah. Everybody in the world knows that, but they don't know the pertinent information, the names, the dates, the places, what the mission was all about. Where have I been? I don't think you can name a significant country anywhere in the world that I have not been and spent at least a month covertly. Hmm. So, um, you said that like the uh, intelligence teams are in twos? Hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Anything more than two, you compromise. The larger the group, the more you have an ability to compromise yourself. Mm -hmm. So uh, you uh, had one other man. Did, did you, that you and that man like work together throughout the duration of that time, or were you? Uh, we worked together until he got killed. Yeah, killed. I've had two other partners mm -hmm. during that period of time. I drug the bodies back. Nobody was ever left behind. So, up until uh, Vietnam started, uh, you were working for the SEALs as an intelligence man. Um, when Vietnam started, did, did uh, the president or uh, your commanding officers send you there specifically for information, or how did uh, like you get sent to Vietnam? The only way I can answer the question involving Vietnam, what I did or didn't do in Vietnam, is to answer you this way. I was there. I was in the Delta, on the ground in the Delta, with uh, Marine Recon. I served on the river, the Mekong River. I also served as intelligence gathering in North Vietnam, in Cambodia, and Laos. Other than that, I cannot go into any other detail.
Now, uh, aside from being in the intelligence, was uh, were you involved in any like other forms of SEAL activity that I'm aware of, like uh, such as like ambushing or I've read about prisoner, no. none, none of that? No, whoa, whoa, you said something about prisoner. Uh, like, Pri not POWs specifically, I have another question for that later, but mm -hmm. would you go into, an, on an operation, would you go in and try to snatch a prisoner for intelligence? Like, would you go yeah. capture VC or NVA? Yeah, that was part of it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, what was like the conditions of Mekon Delta in the operational, like, <laughs> environment? Wet and stinky. Wet and stinky. <laughs> Wet and stinky. Where that one? Hot. Now there was no warm days in Vietnam, right? Or they're all yeah, very hot. Yeah, there ain't no ice cream down in front of us either. <laughs> <laughs> um, I understand like mostly the operations would probably take place at night? Uh, no. No, that's a misconception. Mm -hmm. uh, a SEAL team unit works 24 hours a day. It works on the opportunities as it presents itself. See? And you learn that in the field. Mm -hmm. If you go Try to give you an illustration without letting th any things out. <laughs> All right. Uh, me and my teammate was assigned to go into a specific country to kill a specific individual. I went to Fort Lewis before, uh, earlier, and became a sniper. I used a 50 caliber single shot rifle to qualify as an expert at three miles away I had to hit a target that day. And actually I had the scope and all that to go with it. But to qualify as a seal sharpshooter I had to take out a four inch square target three miles away. I had to find it. I had to hit it, and I had one shot. There was no time limit. But anyway, me and my friend, we were assigned to do this task. Were we successful? Yes. Me and my friend were so successful that the North Vietnamese government at that time put a hundred thousand dollar bounty on my head. I didn't miss. Don't ask me how many times I did it because I can't tell you. I'll tell you that one incident has no names, no places, no countries, no dates, no nothing involved. But that would give you an idea. We'd go out in the jungle, a helicopter would take us in, or a boat would take us up river, as far as it could go. We'd leave, we'd get off. Uh, part of the preparations is we neither showered nor shaved uh, for two weeks before we even went out. That was one thing the French made, a big mistake. North Vietnamese spelled cologne out. Anything unusual they can smell, so you've got to blend. And your body odor is one of the things that blend. Believe it or not, you stink just like I stink. The same thing that causes you to stink causes me to stink. We all press fire, our body oils, all of that is all part of the uh, unpleasantness of body odor. But in that kind of setting, it's your protection. It's like a, a bulletproof vest or a helmet, by the way, which we don't wear. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't, basically to prepare, you wouldn't shower, shave, or do any normal... Two weeks, nothing. Wash. You didn't even brush your teeth. That's the reason I don't have any teeth now. <laughs> you couldn't brush your teeth, you couldn't gargle, you couldn't walk, you couldn't do anything. Change clothes. Um, okay, so... I'm assuming that, uh, I don't know if you can tell me, if you can't, it's perfectly fine, mm -hmm. but... The one incident where you went into that country, 
was as a sniper. Was uh, the man you were sent to eliminate uh, a member of like the North Vietnamese Army, a higher ranking officer, or no comment? No comment. All right, sir. All right, um, we only have five minutes. We're going to change the table. All right. So, intelligence was your main role. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and subversive activities. Uh, again, I can't go into much of that. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody with any kind of common sense know what subversive activities are. Okay, I was involved. Uh, where? All over. Why? I was told. I was following orders. It was one of those kind of missions that uh, uh, you knew up front if you got caught, nobody knew you. You carried no identification. Uh, I had, at that time, no marks or scars or tattoos, anything to permanently identify me that was visible uh, without clothes on, or with clothes on. Mm -hmm. Um, see, uh, I, I've read, and you can, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but sometimes, uh, the SEAL teams, with the, under the intelligence, you know, title, they work with, like, the CIA on certain operations. Did you mm -hmm. do any such things like that? Mm -hmm. Like, they would just basically be the same thing, or? I don't know what you mean by the same thing. Uh, basic intelligence gathering, like. There's a lot of ways to gather intelligence. Mm -hmm. And some of those were like prisoners, or what other methods could you use to gather intelligence? Like, what were some of the ones you used? If you have ten. I'm pausing because I want to come up with the right answer and not give away anything. We used whatever means came to mind to get what we had to get, mm -hmm. to get what we came for. Uh, nothing was unacceptable. And I'll end it there. All right. <laughs> um, how long were you uh, serving in Vietnam? Like, I served four years in Vietnam. And uh, he worked as an intelligence gatherer all mm -hmm. four years. Wow, let's see. What, were you? Uh, were you at a? Did you have a uh, a station where you stayed at, or were you constantly moving around the country? There was a command station, a command center at Da Nang. Uh -huh. uh, we were in radio contact. Uh, we had specific times to broadcast. Mm -hmm. uh, we could receive at any time. But to conserve battery, uh, you turned your uh, your set on. Uh, you had a receiver that was just a receiver, and it was operated by a battery. Mm -hmm. And you had a transmitter, which was just a transmitter, and it was operated by a battery. Okay, uh, they're two different units because one member of the team would carry one, and the other member of the team would carry the other one. That way, if this guy got killed, captured, or exploded, okay, the other man still had some form of communications. You could take the transmitter, the receiver, okay, and manipulate the electronics inside the, and broadcast Morse code. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, the easiest thing to broadcast in Morse code is SOS. Dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, dot, dot. Okay? Mm -hmm. And that's what you would do. Well, they would triangulate in on that source of the signal and send a helicopter to come get you. That never happened, but that was the scenario. Mm -hmm. So if, if something would happen, yeah. that was how it would yeah. play out. That's the reason why there's two. I mean, it was very simple. They could have put it in one unit. Mm -hmm. But the uppers and, and, and the seals, uh, by this time, we had senior officers. Uh, that were SEAL trained mm -hmm. up through the ranks, okay, 
uh, and this is what they wanted, and this is the reason they wanted it, is because if one guy got knocked off, and he was he, the other man couldn't get to him by or by exposing himself unnecessarily. Okay, the transmitter is self-explanatory. Yeah, you just turned the transmitter on. You didn't talk. You just turned it on, and they could triangulate and come get you. Mm -hmm. They knew that if you just turned your transmitter on and didn't say anything, at a time when you were not supposed to, they knew you were in trouble. That's the only time you would do that. Mm -hmm. So that's how they would mm -hmm. like, oh. And we never got into that situation. Mm -hmm. I didn't. Other teams did. Okay. Um, so after uh, four years in Vietnam serving with the SEALs, like what, what would happen after you were done serving in Vietnam? Like were you shipped back to state the states, or uh, were you sent to like other countries to uh, continue operating as intelligence? Uh, well, at first I was sent home uh, for R and R, mm -hmm. ninety days. Uh, in the military, you, you earn 30 days leave a year, all right? So four times 30, that's 120. Mm -hmm. So I had, a, I had 120 days that I could have gone home, but I went home 90 days. Uh, it was tough. It was tougher being out of, of that atmosphere than it was being in. Uh, you never turned your back on no one. You never... Uh, you consciously uh, were uh, suspicious of everyone, even family members. Okay, um, and this is what I mean by it. They, they knew how to put all this in you to key you up, but they didn't know any way to take it out. The only way they could take it out was to make you a money by, by uh, 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 medications. Uh, I take them today. I take them every day. I take them three times a day because I don't want to go back to jail. I know if I don't take the medications, I'm going to go back to jail because I'm going to do something that will warrant it. Mm -hmm. See, there's a lot of guys, a lot of guys, more guys than you people could ever imagine that are out in the woods or out in the mountains or somewhere where there's no population for them to get in trouble with because they're that fierce. I have a brother like that. For 22 years with the uh, Army Green Beret, 82nd Airborne. He put three tours in Vietnam. The only way they could get this guy settled down is the government gave him seven acres of ground, the wooded area of the state of Washington, and told him he had to build a house and a barn. And the time it took him to build a house and a barn, guys, what the therapy was to get all this out of it to where he was more congenial with the average person on the street. Briggs, that's his name, he'd buy his drop a hat. So, um, obviously it's a, a huge difference going back to the, the country after serving in Vietnam. Like, how did, how was the like, general atmosphere towards the war at that time? Well, uh, put it this way, uh, my baby sister, I went back, oh, you dress uniform, medals and ribbons, all shiny, neat, and nice. I walked into my baby sister's house and she says, you're not welcome here, you're just a lousy baby killer, get out. Must have made you very angry or... How'd you feel about that? Hurt? Not angry. Uh, hurt, disappointed. Uh, extremely unwelcome. Um, that was 30 years ago. Uh, it's that way today. A lot of people. A lot of people. Uh, I had a run in down here in Rome, a guy at Denny's. Uh, 
I dress like I dress. And he made a comment about it. And I told him, look, fella, I said, I want no trouble. I can be one of two things. I can be your best friend that will never stick, never give up on you. Or I can be your worst enemy. Just watch your mouth. And he says, what are you going to do? I says, mister, don't ask those kind of questions. Just leave me alone. The manager, who I knew, came up and asked a man to leave. Because he knew who I was, he knew what I had been, he knew what I had been through. He was a uh, 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 retired uh, Marine uh, recon. Okay. Uh, and he asked a man to leave. He said, leave me alone or leave. And come to find out, this guy works for the Rome Sentinel. So people are always inadvertently. I like to try to give people the benefit of the doubt. They're always trying to push your buttons. You don't want to see what I can do. You don't want to see it. And I do it, turn around and walk away just like nothing happened. That's a training. That's how it's ingrained. That's the only way you get men and women to do the things that has to be done in today's world. It ain't pretty out there. If you think the United States of America is this big, bright, lily white, perfect society, you're wrong. Because if we were, we would not survive in today's world. We had to. This is the reason why Kennedy started all this. Kennedy was the first president to realize that as detestable as it was to us as a nation, and as a civilization, we had to get down and dirty if we were going to survive. We had to get down and dirty, just as down and dirty, or dirtier than the opposition. It took special people to do that. So, um, after you, you had your leave and, uh, you know, you were, did, were you allowed, were you like offered to leave the Navy after? Your service in Vietnam, or well, you see, being a SEAL mm -hmm. and being in the Navy is two different things. Okay. In the Navy, you sign a contract for a specific period of time. Mm -hmm. As long as you physically qualify to maintain that contract, you're expected to. A Navy SEAL is a volunteer. You can bring out any time. Okay. Uh, you don't do anything. You don't go anywhere. You don't see anybody. Uh, there's a specific place on every base that where seals are stationed, and there's a bell, and you go over and you ring the bell three times, and you're photographed, and you just walk you know, back to the barracks, you gather up your clothes, and you go back to your last command. That's the way it's done. Now, as far as the Navy is concerned, uh, I re-enlisted every time, uh, and it was a good enlistment. I had to fulfill that enlistment uh, when I was, you know, after I got a number of years in, 10, 15 years in, uh, I realized the retirement potential, and uh, I'm sorry I keep moving around. But I'm not used to this. Uh, you, uh, and you're bringing back memories that I've forgotten a long time ago, but anyway. Uh, I even forgot what the heck I was. <laughs> uh, but anyway, no, the, the, the enlistment is for a specific period of years. I enlisted the first time for four years. All right, the consecutive time was for six years. Okay. Uh, 30 years is uh, for enlisted, it's automatic return. No matter what your enlistment still calls for. You see, when you re-enlist, you get a bonus. Mm -hmm. so, 
and you're expected to earn that bonus by serving that time. That's in addition to your regular base pay. But Congress said for an enlisted man, 30 years. For an officer, it varies as to the rank. Uh, uh, you go to captain, if uh, you have to retire, if you're a captain and you hit 30 years, and you're not on the list for promotion to Admiral or Commodore, and you have to go out. If you hit 30 years and you're on the list to become an Admiral or a Commodore, Rear Admiral, two stars, or a Commodore, which is one star, uh, then you're allowed to stay in an additional 10 years or 40. If you don't go to flag, which is a Commodore or an Admiral, uh, within that 10 year period, you're out. See that? They have to make room for the, the younger coming up through the line. People don't understand that, but that's the way it is. The future is to use you guys, not me. I've had my say. I've done my thing. I'm just living up whatever time I got left is the best I can do. Very well said. Um, <clears throat> now, after like, did you decide to stay in the Navy mm -hmm. for 30 years mm -hmm. and? Well, I decided to stay in the Navy. Um, I was offered OCS. Mm -hmm. uh, I declined it. Uh, my commanding officer said, why? And I said, Captain, respectfully, you don't want to know. He says, respectfully, Chief, I do want to know. Why? He says, we feel that you would make a very good uh, senior officer. And I says, sir, with all respect, I commend this outfit as an enlisted man. I intend to leave this outfit as an enlisted man. I get more respect as an E-9 chief petty officer than most of your commanders and lieutenant commanders do, from the men and the officers. The only thing you can offer me is more responsibility, and I don't need it. Three, 24 years in at that time. Uh, I went to Damneck, Virginia uh, as an instructor. Um, had a heart attack. Um, the Navy and it's expressing its thanks for what I had accomplished uh, allowed me to stay in uh, and finished 30 years, uh, but I was uh, a pencil pusher. Uh, I became a, a, a drug uh, counselor, and uh, that's how I finished my, my 30 years. Mm -hmm. So, finished 30 years in terms of the Navy in 1985, correct? Right? Mm -hmm. November 19th, just past the anniversary. <laughs> November 19th, all right. Anything else you'd like to stay or I'm all done? The only thing I'd like to say is to young people like yourself. Set yourself realistic goals. Do everything within your power to be a success at attaining that goal within a reasonable period of time. Don't give up. Quitters never win, and winners never quit. Well, sir. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. You're welcome.